Hi, I'm Lynn Adams. I'm Justin Gross. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for our first quarter market update as we're heading into Valentine's Day 2023. Uh, just a quick note, everything we share on this call is for educational purposes only. Uh, nothing here is, needs to be considered as investment advice. So, With that, uh, we'll get started. We're looking at uh, some information that we put out a year ago. We talked about last year two paths for 22. Sounded really catchy, um, but there was two different ways things could go from a year ago, depending on how the Fed chose to respond to inflation. As we can see, uh, we ended up going on the inflation control side, which has been pretty painful for investors for the year 2022. For those of you not tuned in, obviously interest rates went from one to four and a half. Large stock market pieces were down 20 to 40 percent. Interest rates pushed bond values down 10 to 25 percent. It was a pretty difficult year. Uh, but we want to kind of talk a little bit about some of the details and what that looks like going forward. Um, this chart here is a chart of the S&P 500, and this is really designed to show us not just the ups and downs of the market, but if you'll notice in the red circled area that the price to earnings ratio, so this is the price that investors are willing to pay relative to the earnings that the stocks are producing, that actually was a pretty dramatic decrease where investors were paying 21 times earnings for stocks a year ago, now they're only paying 16 times earnings today. If you think about that from maybe the growth stock spectrum, uh, you know, growth stocks are even more pricey on a valuation standpoint. Some of the very growthy names, we're not allowed to mention individual stock names, but, um, but one of the companies that we all have a couple of items running around our house that we use to communicate with, they were selling at 40 times earnings uh, a year ago, and they're down at 20 times earnings. So pretty big difference in waiting 40 years to get your money back in earnings versus 20 years. Yeah, I mean, stocks. Stocks had a bad year, but they do that from time to time. Stocks go up, stocks go down. A 20% year is not unheard of. We've seen it before. The average is something like 14, peak to trough in a year. So we know that. I think bonds are the, uh, yeah. and we'll lead into that, were the, uh, the outlier return from last year that made portfolio management difficult. Yeah, take a look at the, this chart of bond returns historically. Definitely, you know, the, the entry year decline for the Barclays Ag, which is an index that tracks a basket of bonds over different variations of duration, was down 13% for the year, is down as much as 17% entry year. And there are other bond sectors like high quality long-term government bonds were down 20, 25% for the year. So really difficult year for bonds. Bond prices go down when rates go up. So if Justin were to buy a bond that's paying us 4% and matures in 10 years, and a new bond from that same issuer that would go up to 5%, if he wanted to sell that bond to me, I'd say, well, Justin, that's only paying me four. I'm not gonna give you what you paid for it. I have to give you something less, because I could go get a new bond to pay the five. So that's how the market works. When interest rates go up, prices of bonds go down. Yeah, we experience that in life all the time. If the new one is better than the old one, the old one's worth less, you know, right? Even if the new one isn't better. Right, right. <laughs> so, but yeah, so the bond market had a tough year as, again, Fed raised rates. Uh, Fed funds went from targeting around 1%, maybe even less than 1%, to up over 4 So it was a pretty dramatic move in one year. And I think the psychological difference is important, too, because if, if you go into a normal year of stock market and you had a crystal ball and they said market stock market returns are going to be very poor, you may say, okay, well, I would like to buy bonds because of that natural historical um, relationship, counter relationship, and you may even say, I want to buy long dated bonds mm -hmm. so I could get more bang for my buck. Right. But the interest rate prevailing scenario just took down everything last year. But. Well, that's actually a good segue. If you look at this next chart, one year later, you know, a lot of investors, probably the, the median investor of all investors in the economy, is a 60 40 split 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. And that's because over the long run, that relationship between stocks and bonds has produced a pretty high amount of return, and the risk or the volatility has been controlled because normally when stocks are doing well, bonds aren't, or when there's scared investors in the stock market, they run into bonds. So this sort of like the seesaw effect of having stocks and bonds. But a 60-40 model last year, as it turns out, 
turned out to be one of the worst performing years that a 60-40 strategy has ever had. I mean, if you look on here, the 2007-2008 crisis, that, that was a 20% decline. We all, you know, that's been coined the Great Recession. But in that period of time, you know, the stock market part was down almost 40, 38, 39%. In this case, you know, the stock market was down 20 or 30, but the bond market really made it even worse. And you can see a couple other periods, the 70s were like that as well. Um, so, so it was a tough year for both stocks and bonds. Um, you can see here, this is a, a chart of 2022 as being a dramatic outlier. Uh, it has, it's the only year in hundred and some odd years where you add the returns together and you have this very, very rotten bottom left-hand corner result. So Yeah, bottom left-hand corner is bad on this chart. Upper right-hand corner is great. Yeah. And kind of one of these things is not like the other. Uh, 2022 is yeah. it's a bad spot to be on that chart. So all of that is a function of the Fed trying to fight inflation. And so... You know, we talked last year about the economy, you know, the number of jobs, average income, personal balance sheets, uh, availability of resources, asset prices, all those things were looking great. The Fed has to go on this mission to reduce inflation. This chart here shows that, hey, we're, they're making some progress. Finally, these rate cuts are making progress. Uh, looking at it, it seems that inflation peaked out around 9% uh, mid-year and by the end of the year, back down into the 7% range. And some of that's Fed-induced, some of it is energy. You know, it's interesting how fast people go get electric cars if they feel like they're gonna save $500 a month in gas versus how fast they'll get an electric car if they're only saving $100 a month in gas. You know, it's a, inflation is to some degree a self-healing mechanism. When it gets too expensive to buy stuff, people stop buying stuff. But the Fed is helping um, in this front. And I think that there's consensus that maybe we're getting close to uh, a pivot point. So let's talk about where to next. This is information from the Federal Reserve. Um, this is a chart of the, the Fed's influence on interest rates over time. And the, you can see that the black line is gone up to 4.38 Fed funds rate and it's projected by the Fed to peak out around 5.1. Now, what's really interesting about this is that it's projected to peak out around 5.1 somewhere in the beginning part of 2024, and then it's projected to go down to 3.1 in the following 24 months. So I think you have to ask yourself, why is the Fed forecasting such a radical pullback after we get to the end of this year? And I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I think you'd have to ask Jerome himself. But I think it has to do with the fact that they know that that very restrictive policy will really hurt the economy long term and that they will they just want to get inflation down and then they'll sort of have this let's resume normal operations mentality. You agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the old saying, don't fight the Fed. It's not a given that what they project Probably it's not going to happen exactly that way, but that, those are the projections, so we need to look at them. And if you're trying to not fight the Fed and they're moving in a certain direction, then it's valuable to, to look at, see what these various um, asset classes might do with those projections. So I put this together as a little chart to help us understand mathematically what could happen if the Fed does get it right. And again, could and maybe does get it right, the operative words. If you look at the, 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 the yellow part on this chart, and we talk about rates are gonna continue to rise for this year, and we take Fed funds from the mid fours up to maybe low fives. If that happens, we know that the relationship between interest rates and price to earnings ratios is inverse, so price to earnings ratios would, would need to come down. So, so those would fall a little bit, and if you apply, let's say, a 14 times earnings to the, to the S&P versus a 16 times earnings, you'd see the S&P trade around 3,500, assuming 250 in earnings. So that might be a, a, a 10, 15% decline from where we're at right now. If, if that is the projection of where we're gonna land and if, if the market were to believe that's where we're gonna stay for a while. Uh, on the bond market, if you raise rates another 10 or 15%, 
then you would expect to see the total return of most bonds go down 1% to 10%, depending on what, how, how long the bond is and what the yield is. But we probably could, could say that there is a, some possibility that if we have another six, eight months of rate heights, that the markets will still be suppressed for another six to eight months. One slight difference on the bond piece of, of that projection. When it happened last year, we didn't have a lot to fight it. Right, the price movement, there wasn't yield to offset that price movement. Right. Now there is a little bit of yield, so I would think that that might be dampened a little bit um, on the bond side, but, but yet the rising rates are going to do their thing with bonds, as we discussed earlier. Yeah, so imagine if you had a bond yielding 7 and the new ones go to 8. Well, if you're getting 7 while it goes to 8, even though there's downward pressure, you're still getting 7. So yeah, to Justin's point, it would be, it would be offset by the fact there's really a yield. Let's look at this next period, this flat rate period, because there's going to be a point where rates plateau. And I think that's the period that's really interesting, because I feel like when, when the market feels that the Fed is nearing the end of this, they want to put money to work. And so my suspicion is, is that the P.E. ratios that we're in today will kind of hold, but the anxiety about rising rates goes away and money begins to come back into the markets. And I think that's healthy for the stock market. And I think it's also healthy for the bond market because there's probably bond investors that would typically own bonds. That's like, well, I'm gonna sit out until the Fed is done because I don't wanna lose any of my yield. So, so when we get to that flat weight rate period, I think we get a little sideways action. I think bondholders get the yield on the note and I think the stock market investors get the earnings times the multiples. I mean, I think you get a decent return in that period. But the, the far right-hand side of this chart, the declining rate period, I think that's where investors finally get rewarded for their patience. And that's really what the long-term investor is in the stock market for in the first place, is to endure the storm. But when the Fed begins to pull rates back to normal ranges of the four to three percent and price to earnings ratios can expand back up to historically normal price to earnings ratios. If the S&P produces 260 to 290 dollars of earnings per share, that puts your S&P value in the 4700, which would be a 20 percent, 25 percent increase over where we are here in the last couple of weeks. So I think that there is a silver lining for stocks and I think also in the bond market. And if you are now getting yields in the fives for maybe an investment grade strategy and, and rates go back down a percent, I think you get the five plus maybe a couple extra percent sort of um, as the price of bonds goes up when yields go down. So maybe you end up in the seven range. You know? yeah, which, by the way, for conservative investors, they haven't been able to get that yield almost since 08. That's yeah. a long time ago, right, to, to actually be in bonds and feel like you're getting rewarded with some yield. So, I mean, as, as last year was a tough environment, the projections as we as we finish that environment get to towards the end that's when you want to be adding money right for that new regime of flat and then declining rates yeah, and i think one of the old adages that i hear tossed around uh, warren buffett used to say you know you you make money by being fearful when others are greedy and you be greedy when others are fearful this market has really made people uncomfortable and a lot of people um, we're thinking maybe I shouldn't be an investor. Maybe I shouldn't be invested in this market. Maybe I should have less invested. And I think that you have to realize that it's in the darkness and in the in the fog of these moments is when the best opportunity to, to get in and to be investing for the long run actually happens. So the, the market's built on a wall of worry. There's always something to worry about, and this this time's no different. And you are perfect with your segues today. Yeah. So the next slide, is a perfect segue. Um, careful using the R word. Now, in this case, the R word is recession. The, the markets want to worry about something. And so what they want to worry about right now is the fear of a recession. This slide, I just think it's so important for someone when they want to talk about the, the upcoming recession for you to see this in the perspective that it's actually uh, set in. This chart shows you the GDP growth and earnings per share for the last, uh, gosh, 30 years, give or take, 25, 30 years. And what you can see is leading into the COVID economy shutdown, uh, 2019, 2020, 
we were at $150, $155 a share of earnings. Very healthy, long-term growth was positive. COVID came along, really hurt the economy. Earnings per share went down under $125 a share. So that was an earnings recession of a very significant magnitude, very similar to the 2007, 2008. And then from there, we now have seen earnings expand all the way up over $210 a share. So we've had literally like a 60% in 18 months earnings explosion. So if somebody says, well, we're getting ready to have a recession, an earnings recession, and we give up, you know, four or $5 of earnings uh, on the grand scheme, if you give up seven, eight, nine percent after you just made 60% moves forward, like, okay, yes, technically it's a recession, but I mean, I think it's fair to give up a little bit. I mean, that's an incredible return. Even if you look at the earnings growth since before COVID, you know, if you look at the pre-COVID highs for earnings, we're 40% higher than that now. So, and then the projections you can also see in blue, most of the estimates when they add up all their individual tabulated values of what the companies that they follow are gonna earn, those numbers are very, very good as well. So the recession word is about worry. All recessions are not created equal, right? I mean, and, and the magnitude of this pullback doesn't appear to be to the other ones that we know of, COVID, 08, even back to 2000, 2002. But to your point, investors want to worry. We want to worry Find about something. something. Yeah. That worry creates doubt, and doubt creates uncertainty, and uncertainty creates opportunity. And that opportunity is why we try to buy things when things are down for the long run. So talking about buying some things, we're, we have been tiptoeing back into the markets for some of our tactical money. For 2023, we have a bias more towards the value side of stocks. So these are more of your blue chip, well-established, dividend-paying, dividend, dividend paying, cash-rich companies. Um, I tend to think that the growth side of the stock market is going to continue to be very jittery because as interest rates move, growth stocks valuations move around a lot. I think I kind of think a lot of intelligent investors will, will bet more on value coming out of this uncertainty than they will on growth. And historically, if you look at post-recessionary periods, value tends to lead the way out. So we've got a little bit bigger bet on value this year than we do on growth. And we think that'll help us to have uh, a good return and maybe even stabilize some of the, the, the madness of the market for the next little bit of time, having more in value. I want to just reiterate, and you know, obviously uh, it seems taboo, but stay patient. You know, stay in the course. Uh, time in the market is way more valuable than timing the market. And I want to go back and show you a couple slides that we showed last year at this time when we talked about the impact of the Fed raising rates, what it might do for the economy, what it might do for stocks and bond prices. We, we shared that last, last year, we shared this, that in the 70s, when the Fed had to really aggressively fight inflation, you know, inflation went from three to six to 11 uh, in two and a half years. The Fed had to really aggressively raise rates. And while they did that, the bond market really suffered and also the stock market really suffered. In 1976 and 1977, inflation had come back down and kind of was, was more uh, in a manageable range, still high. And so once it just stopped and the Fed stopped raising rates, you kind of see that the, the investment grade uh, bonds did very well, and so did the stocks. But then there was a set uh, round two, so inflation kind of then started creeping up again. Late seventies went from seven to eleven to thirteen, and so it was almost like it was a one-two punch for that period of time. And the Fed then also started increasing rates again to fight it a second time. But notice here the bond market section, the lower box, those returns were not negative. They, were, they weren't great, they were slightly positive, but the reason they weren't negative is because all the yield they were getting because the coupon had been raised. So as they were raising rates, that yield was offsetting further rate increases to Justin's point just a few minutes ago. So we think we're coming into a place now where if the Fed does raise rates even further, we're getting enough yield now that you won't actually lose a bunch of money as they increase rates. But if you look at the, the stock piece, you know, again, at the beginning cycle, of the Fed, the Fed raising rates, it lost a lot of money, lost 14, lost 26. You know, our market from top to bottom last year 
was probably in the 30s. Growth stuff was down near 50. Um, and then you get the recovery, though, and, and you can see in the late 70s, once they got inflation under control, it set the stage, this long red box. That was a 20-year period where stocks averaged almost 20% a year. So you got to get the foundation right. you got to get inflation under control. We're well on our way. And I think, obviously, there's no guarantee that what happened in the past is going to happen in the future. But it does seem like a similar song. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a tough cycle. And everything's a cycle. That's what we're talking about here, different cycles. But to not invest money or to not maintain exposure to growth or to, to stocks, maybe, in this cycle would be to bet that things are not going to get better in the future. And I just don't believe that. So to kind of recap, our current strategy for 2023, we are still very diversified. We have not only stocks, we have bonds. Uh, we have more individual bonds now than we used to own because we want to make sure we can control the maturity dates as best as we can. We own real estate, our income producing real estate pieces that we have, and money markets. I mean, heck, we're getting over 4% in a couple of money market accounts that we have. So we're very diversified. The, we do have an active plan to move a little bit from money market into stocks a little bit each month for the next four or five months trying to do a little bottom fishing if we get more volatility on the fixed income side like on the bond side as i said we we're trying to actually own more individually issued bonds because if you own an individual issued bond you know when it's going to mature you know how much you're going to get and and you don't have to worry about redemptions in the fund pushing the value around it's like you're gonna get this much back on this date and this much interest. Um, money market rates are looking good, so we're okay with holding a fair amount of money in money market. Um, I don't remember my career being able to get 4.2, 4.1 on the money market, so that's pretty exciting. Um, we are pulling back on real estate. We made a lot of money there in the last year and a half. We're taking a little bit of profits on that portion. And like we said earlier, we're gonna really focus more on large cap value more than growth in this next part of the cycle for stocks. Anything else you wanna to add to that, Justin, you think of? No, I mean, it's a, that's been a good recap of where we where we thought we were, might go, where we went. Um, I think for the conservative investor, um, I've, I've been saying kind of short-term pain for long-term gain. Last year was a pullback in the bond market, unlike we've seen in much of history. Um, but you get through that cycle and now there's there's interest again. And so for the conservative investor who doesn't, they just don't like the volatility of, right. of other markets, it's gonna be nice to be able to get some yield for the first time in a long time. Well, every, every client situation is different. Risk preferences, volatility, tolerances, your goals, your appetite for different kinds of investments. But we're here to give you great advice, to help guide you through the tough decisions. Hopefully this update will help you get some perspective on where we're at with the investments that we're running. Uh, feel free to call us, email us anytime, and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to serve you and your families. These views stated are not necessarily the opinion of Satera Advisor Networks, LLC. It should not be construed as direct or indirect offered to buy or sell securities. Uh, due to volatility within the markets, pension opinions are subject to change without notice. Information is based on sources believed to be reliable. However, their accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investors cannot directly invest in indices. The performance of any index is not indicative of the performance of any investment. It does not take into account the risks of inflation, fees, or expenses associated with investing. All investing involves risks, including the possibility of loss of principal. There's no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. These examples are hypothetical only and do not represent the actual performance of any particular investment. Investments in securities do not offer a fixed rate of return. Principal yield and or share price will fluctuate with changes in market conditions when sold or redeemed. You may receive more or less than originally invested.